understanding to Isaiah 55, verses 8 through 11. Isaiah 55, 8 through 11. be reading from the New Living Translation. Isaiah 55, verse 8. My thoughts are nothing like your thoughts, says the Lord, and my ways are far beyond anything you could imagine. For just as the heavens are higher than the earth, so my ways are higher than your ways, and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. The rain and snow come down from the heavens and stay on the ground to water the earth. They cause the grain to grow, proceed producing seed for the farmer and bread for the hungry. Verse 11, it is the same with my word. I send it out and it always produces fruit. It will, not might, it will accomplish all I want it to and it will prosper everywhere I send it. Father, we just ask this morning that you set me aside, allow your word to come forth from my mouth. Father, let what you want this congregation to receive be just be manifested lord not just in their words but lord let it just take root in their heart and in their minds and mine as well father god teach us holy spirit this morning what thus says your word and we give you all the glory we give you all the honor and all the praise have your way your will be done in jesus's name amen you may be seated The title for my message this morning is Getting Out of God's Way. I think we all, pretty much everybody here, desires to serve God. We desire to do what God wants us to do. None of us comes into church on Sunday looking for ways to sin and looking for ways to rebel against God. We all have that desire to do uh, according to his commandments and according to his word. We desire to see God move in our lives and in the lives of those we pray for. We pray because we expect results. We pray as in Mark eleven twenty four, where it says, I tell you, you can pray for anything. And if you believe you have received it, it will be yours. And Matthew 21, 22 says, and all things you ask in prayer, believing you will receive. So when we pray and when we, we desire to follow the Lord, it is not intentional when we get in his way. At least I hope it's not. But there's many, many ways we do get in God's way. And it's part of it is the humanness of us. And the other part is also self. Because there's a, in our makeup, there's this inherent trait that as we grow up and as we become independent, we can do things. We just take the ball and run with it. We can do things ourselves. And so sometimes we're praying and asking God to do something, but we run ahead of him. Because we we think we know exactly what we're asking. So therefore, we know exactly what we want, and God, you can come along and help me, but I'm going to lead the way here. And we all do that at different times with different situations. We don't mean to, but, but it's our human makeup that makes us do that. And Isaiah 55, 11 tells us clearly God's word will prosper wherever it is sent, and it will accomplish all he sent it to accomplish. It doesn't necessarily say he will do it exactly when we want him to do it. And that's where the hang-up is. When we don't get what we want, when we want it, it's prime territory for us then to run ahead or, or to you know, run before God, to, to interfere with what God's wanting to do. Because he works in all types of situations. We have a preconceived idea of how God works. We believe when we're praying for something, we see in our minds the result we want. If we're praying for loved ones to be saved or wa- loved ones to be delivered, In our minds, we see that. We know what we want. And we see it according to our humanness, the way it's going to play out. But we just learned in Isaiah, God's ways are not our ways. His thoughts aren't our thoughts. And his ways are always higher than our ways. So typically what happens is we begin to help the situation. We begin sometimes totally unintentional and totally unaware we begin to mold a person a certain way. We might begin to nag. We might begin to repeat ourselves over and over and over because that person isn't acting the way we want them to act. And we've been praying, so why aren't they acting the way we want them to act? I better help God along and remind them they need to act the way we want them to act. We 
we do that in all sorts of ways. But there's times where God wants to work through adversity. There's times where God wants to work through suffering. We don't like to see loved ones suffer. We don't like to see anybody suffer, and we certainly don't want to suffer ourselves. But sometimes it's in the valley. Sometimes it's in the midst of that suffering. God is doing a mighty work. And because it's uncomfortable or because it's something that's not familiar or something we want to remain in, we look fervently for a way out. And a lot of times those are the the prime times where we get in the way of God. And when we get in the way of God, it's not that his word will not come forth and do everything his word says he will come forth and do with it. It's that we may prolong it. We may inhibit it. We may make life a whole lot harder than it has to be. Because ultimately, we are praying, we are saying, we trust you, Lord, but our actions are saying something much different. And it, it's, it's human of us because we don't want to see anyone we love, anyone in our families, our, our extended families, we don't want to see people hurting. We don't want to see people stuck or, or you know, in addiction or in any kind of, of uh, sin that, that is pulling them away while we're praying so hard for them. But it really does come down to trust because it's at those times that God has reminded us his ways aren't our ways. He's reminded us he will do everything he said he will do. But it, we're operating in time when God's not. And so because of that, we tend to get in his way. And today I want to go over a few ways that we do end up getting in his way. There's many, many ways, but I'm just going to touch on a few of them. We find in Proverbs 18.21 that the tongue can bring death or life. And those who love to talk will reap the consequences. One of the biggest ways that we get in his way is by what we speak. We will spend 30 minutes before the throne in prayer for something. And, and we know it's going to take that miracle of God to have that happen. But in that time before him, we're feeling very strongly that he is going to do it. And then we remove ourselves from that atmosphere, and we're out talking to friends or to family, and we begin to speak all that is wrong with that situation that we just prayed for. We begin to give, give voice to the very thing that God says, leave it alone, come to me, lay it at the altar, leave it there, and let me take care of it. But again, in our humanness, we begin to hinder God's move by speaking against it. We're praying one way, but we're talking a totally different way. We spend a whole lot more time, a whole lot more time sometimes talking against the very thing that we've been praying for. And that's a way to hinder and to prolong the answer to that prayer. And what does that take to change? It takes guarding, putting a guard, as the word says, over my mouth. Lord, shut my mouth. Just shut my mouth. You know, if, if the thought's here, don't let it come out. Let instead what comes out of my mouth agree with what I've been praying. You know, can't hear me? Is this not on? All right, well, I'll get a little louder. That's the best I can do, and I can do it. <laughs> All right. Another way we get in God's way is we fail to understand his will. The will of God is not always explainable not always reasonable, but it is certain. Often we can't understand or accept it because we can't see the whole picture. That's probably one of the biggest detriments to our being able to, to really trust, is we see this much. We see everything in front of us, everything right around us. But there's so much more that God is doing because he is reaching sometimes through what you're going through, he is reaching those around you. And he is in his timeline, which is totally outside of time, working things together for your good, but he's doing it in a timeline that isn't fast enough for you, but yet is working in the lives of others you're not even paying attention to, most likely. Because what God wants to do is produce the most out of that for his glory. He wants to see your prayers answered that will touch the most people around you. And that's the part we don't know. We have to trust. That's where it comes in that we walk by faith and not by sight. If we only go by what we see, it's going to be a miserable life living as a Christian because what we see is ugly. Half the time, more than half the time, it's ugly. When we're praying fervently for something and it's not happening, what we're looking at is ugly. But we've got to look through spiritual eyes, and we've got to hold on to and know that his word never fails. His promises never fail. He promised us that we, whatever we ask in his name, 
If you believe, we will receive. It just doesn't happen exactly when we want it to. And the other component to that is it doesn't happen the way you want it to. Uh, I can't recall a time that I prayed very hard for something and did receive an answer, but certainly not the way that I thought it would come. And I've learned, and I've said this before, I've learned, when I pray, I'm not even going to bother looking for God to come from that way because sure as I'm looking that way, he comes from this way. So it doesn't matter to me how. It just matters to me that he does answer and that I trust him to answer. Go with me, if you would, to Matthew 16, uh, verse 13. Matthew 16, chapter 16, we'll start at verse 13. Again, I'll be reading from the New Living Translation. Everybody have that? When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea, Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say that the Son of Man is? Well, they replied, some say John the Baptist, some say Elijah, and others say Jeremiah or one of the prophets. Then he asked them, but who do you say I am? Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. Jesus replied, you are blessed, Simon, son of John, because my father in heaven has revealed this to you. You did not learn this from any human being. Now I say to you that you are Peter, which means rock, and upon this rock I will build my church, and all the powers of hell will not conquer it. And I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you forbid on earth will be forbidden in heaven. And whatever you permit on earth will be permitted in heaven. Then he sternly warned the disciples not to tell anyone that he was the Messiah. From then on, Jesus began to tell his disciples plainly that it was necessary for him to go to Jerusalem and that he would suffer many terrible things at the hands of the elders, the leading priests, and the teachers of the religious law, and he would be killed. But on the third day, he would be raised from the dead. But Peter took him aside and began to reprimand him for saying such things. Heaven forbid, Lord, he said, this will never happen to you. Jesus turned to Peter and said, get away from me, Satan. You are a dangerous trap to me. You are seeing things merely from a human point of view, not from God's. One of the reasons that he had to, to correct Peter was because he just plainly told Peter and the rest of them exactly why he had come. And in Peter's humanness, Peter was thinking, no, I'm not ready for you to leave us, Lord. You stay with us. This will not happen to you. I'm going to do everything I can to see that this does not happen. And what he did was interfere or attempt to interfere with God's plan. Because basically, God's plan when he was coming to earth, it says in, uh, to wrap up uh, Matthew 16, he says, Jesus wanted his disciples to know two important things that he was the Messiah, the Christ, and two, that he came to die. His death was necessary for the remission of my sins, your sins, and the sins of mankind. Now, Peter understood the first piece. He understood that, when, and it says in there where he said, you are the Christ, the Messiah. He, he got that. But he didn't get, the part he didn't get is that he came to die. And that's because it didn't match up with what Peter wanted. And that's very often what happens to us. We get a certain part of what God's saying, but the part that doesn't agree with our spirit or with our flesh even more so, we tend to say, no, 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 that's not the way. Let's do it a different way. And, and Jesus had to say, get behind me, Satan, because basically had Peter gotten his way and done what Peter wanted to do, none of us would have any chance in heaven today. He had to die. They didn't take his life. He gave his life. So because he couldn't comprehend that second truth and because it didn't agree with his preconceived ideas, he opposed the Lord's redemptive plan, and he opposed it with human reasoning, and it's what we do oftentimes when we run before the Lord. We often do the same thing when our circumstances that we find ourselves in don't line up with those things that we know that God wants for us. We have to understand that's where trust comes in. We walk by faith, not by sight. There's a lot in this word I don't understand. I'm not called to understand it, and neither are you. God gives us a certain amount of understanding of it. 
So when you reach those parts of the word that you don't understand, you're called to accept it. Accept it by faith. Okay, there's, there's some mysteries with contained within the word that we may not know until we're in eternity. And if you spend all your time spinning your wheels wanting to know why or how, you're, you're, wasting out, you're, you're losing out and wasting time on what God wants you to see. He will give you understanding of everything he wants you to understand as you pray and ask before you read the word. But those things that just aren't there in terms of understanding, leave them alone and let God deal with it. At, at the right time, if he wants you to understand it, you will understand it. But we have no excuse for not accepting it because everything in the word tells us he's faithful. Everything we've seen him do throughout history tells us he's faithful. He's not a man that he can lie. He is faithful. So we have no excuse to disbelieve or not accept what God's word says in that area. Another way that we get in his way is often out of our loyalty and love for our loved ones. We, as I said earlier, we don't want to see our loved ones suffer. And in the world of psychology, we often get caught up in doing things what they call ena enabling or codependency. We rescue people out of messes when God's saying, leave them alone in that mess. Trust me to bring them out because sometimes there's a whole lot of learning that he is giving them and understanding of life that he is working one-on-one -on -one with them and does not need your help or my help. But nevertheless, because we love them, we feel like we need to do for them. And the best example in my own life has always been with my great niece, Bree. Uh, I learned early on, though, I, and I thank God. I, one thing I have learned in my walk with God, I have to learn many lessons the hard way, but I don't have to learn the same lesson twice. And, and I'm thankful for that. Once I learn it, I learn it. <laughs> Slow learner as I might be, once I learn a particular lesson, I learn it. And it, it's the most difficult thing in the world if you've ever dealt with a loved one that you know is, is in trouble, is possibly near death. So half the time you don't know where they are, and you know what they're doing. You, in, my, in Bree's case, she was brought back to life four times. Four times she died from OD. And my little baby that I knew, I was in the room when she was born, and had to know all of this. And yet, I would shut my phone off at night when I went to sleep because I had to trust God. I wasn't looking for that 2 o'clock phone call in the morning. I shut my phone off, and I slept well because my God had her. And when we love someone, one of the biggest lessons we need to learn as we grow in Christianity is let God deal with that person you're praying for. Because, again, a lot of learning happens in the valley and in the places of darkness. And we can tend to... to prolong what God wants to do, do to deliver that individual, to save that individual when we run out in front of God to save them, when we run out and rescue them time and time again. It's like putting a Band-Aid on a geyser. We, we plug up the hole for the moment. We haven't fixed the problem because we can't fix the problem. That's God's business, and we need to learn to let God do that. And, of course, our immediate desire is to make things better, but getting in his way never, ever, ever, ever accomplishes it. You may achieve, achieve that momentary success, but in the long run, you are just putting off, and sometimes with drastic consequences, what God wants to do. We want God to immediately heal every physical or emotional ailment and to meet every need. I mean, isn't that the ideal? If every single time we prayed, we got immediate gratification, immediate results, how cool would that be? <laughs> Everybody, I think, would be a Christian if we had that. But the reality is that's not how God works. It doesn't happen immediately. And what we have to remember in those times is that God is at work because he promises to be and leave to God the things that are God's to do. For him, a day is as, as a thousand years, the word tells us. And a thousand years is as a day. So he is not going to do it in that time frame. We can't even fathom that. A day is as a thousand years and a thousand years as a day. That's too mind-boggling. It just tells me that, no, it's not going to happen at the moment I want it to happen, but I can be assured it's going to happen. We need discernment in order to know when to help and when to be still. There are times when we need to intervene, but we need to be praying and asking God, is this the time? And not just automatically running ahead of him and fixing the situation. We need his discernment, and we get that through prayer. We get that through times of refreshing in his presence. We get that through his word and our minds, as pastor has been preaching on, being renewed by reading the word. We have to ask for that because we don't always know in any given situation what God wants us to do without asking him. And if we ask, he will tell us. He'll be faithful to answer us. 
Because what we want for somebody else or for ourselves, which whatever your plans are, what we want, he wants so much more. He wants it a lot more than we do. We have a hard time remembering that. But God wants it more than we do. We just need to get out of his way and let him do it. Another way we get in God's way is by murmuring and complaining. And we can learn an awful lot from the Israelites. Sister Loretta uh, read this morning from Exodus. And in the book of Exodus, when, when Moses was sent by God to tell Pharaoh to let my people go, Pharaoh, being hard-hearted, wasn't having it. He wasn't going to let him go. They, they, they used him. They got work out of him. He wasn't going to let that go. But in the time period that, that Moses was before Pharaoh, God did an awful lot of miracles, an awful lot of miracles in Egypt where the people and Pharaoh had to uh, uh, acknowledge that the God of the universe, God Almighty, was in the midst, was using Moses, and that it was time for him to let the people go. The Israelites saw these. The Israelites were there, and they beheld all of these miracles. They saw what God did to set them free, one miracle after another. And when they were leaving and, and God parted the Red Sea and they got to go through it, they saw God then close the sea up on the Egyptians who were coming after them. Now, you would think, and I would think, that if we saw all of this, by the time we got away from Egypt, we would be praising God, worshiping God, and saying, come what may, Lord, you have proven yourself faithful. I'm just going to do what you say. Not so. <laughs> not so with the Israelites, and not so with us either. We like to think we would be that way, but I don't think we, we typically end up being that way. Before they were even out of Egypt, in Exodus 5, they were complaining to Moses that because of him and his talk of the promised land, fa Pharaoh made things worse for them. So they hadn't even been released yet from captivity, and they're they're complaining because now things are harder because, of course, Pharaoh got mad that Moses was intervening, or God was intervening, really. And so they added the workload to the Egyptians or to the Israelites. And now they're complaining, now look what you did. Now you spoke up and, and told them you want us to go free. Now look what you did. You gave us more work to do with less. Thanks a lot, Moses. <laughs> and in Exodus 14, 11, 12, they're complaining, why did you bring us out here to die in the wilderness? Why did you make us leave Egypt? What have you done to us? Didn't we tell you this would happen? Leave us alone. Can you imagine? <laughs> they're, they're tell they saw God do all these miracles, and now they're complaining, and they're mad at Moses for getting them out of captivity, and they're heading towards freedom. They're heading towards the promised land, but they're mad. They're mad. Then they complained in Exodus 15.24 about the bitter water. They complained to Moses in Exodus 17.1 because they were thirsty, and they accused him of bringing them out of Egypt just to kill them. In Numbers 12, 1 through 12, we see where Miriam and Aaron, Moses' brothers, are criticizing Moses' Moses's leadership. And so the Lord curses Miriam with leprosy. And in Numbers 13, through, uh, 31 through 32 tells us 12 spies were sent. When they finally reached the, the, the end of the, the promised land area, 12 spies were sent over to check out the land and see what this is the land promised, mil the land of milk and honey, promised by God. Delivered out of the Egyptian hold, come into this land. So he sends 12 to go spy out the land. And when they return, 10 of them are going, uh-uh, uh-uh, we saw giants over there. Oh, yeah, there was milk and honey, and there's a whole lot of good stuff, but uh-uh, we, we, we can't go there. There's big giants. And out of those 12 people, only two, only two came back with a good report. Now, remember, God promised this land to them. It's not like they just happened upon an unknown territory and said, let's see if we want to stay here. This is the area God sent them to, promised them. And 10 out of 12 come back going, no way, no way, I'm not going there. We'll be killed. And only two, only two, Joshua and Caleb were the only two that, that came back and said that they can go, that this is, this is the land we will go. Go with me to Numbers 14.26. Numbers 14. And again, from the New Living Translation. Verse 26. Then the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, How long must I put up with this wicked community and its complaints about me? 
Yes, I have heard the complaints the Israelites are making against me. Now tell them this. As surely as I live, declares the Lord, I will do to you the very things I heard you say. You will all drop dead in this wilderness. Because you complained against me, every one of you who is 20 years old or older and was included in the registration will die. You will not enter and occupy the land I swore to give you. The only exceptions will be Caleb, son of Jephunneh, and Joshua, son of Nun. And why was it only those two? Because they believed God. They trusted God. And I'd like to think that we have learned from reading, and we continue to learn from reading what we saw happen with the Israelites, because ultimately what God intended was this journey, once they were, were released from captivity, this journey was meant to take 11 days. And instead, it turned into 40 years. 40 years, what God intended, 11 days. Now think about that. How many things in our lives have taken a little longer than they probably should have because we've gotten in God's way? Maybe not 40 years long, or maybe for some, yeah, 40 years long. But 11 days is, was God's intention. But it wasn't God who, who changed course. God is faithful. God changes not. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So who changes? We do. We're a fickle people. The Israelites are no different than us. We'd like to think they are, but really, they're not. And we, we tend to see that, we see that God walked in the midst in the Old Testament so much. And we would say, well, if we had God walking right here among us today, uh, we would do, we would believe you know, Peter had God walking and denied him three times. Jesus is right there with him. No, I'll never deny you. I'm always going to do whatever you ask me to do. I'll love you forever. Are you the one that was with Jesus? No, not me. Not me. Not me. And that's us. That is us. Much as we hate to admit it, we do this. And when we engage in the habit of complaining, understand this. These are, these are, this is the word of God meant to people, to renew our minds. What we see happening with, with individuals within the Bible are meant to be warning signs sometimes or to, to help us to understand how to act and sometimes how not to act. And this example is a way of showing us how not to act. But when we engage in the habit of complaining, we too prolong not just the answers to our prayers, but also walking victoriously in the things God has intended for us. Because when we're not in agreement with his word and when we're complaining and murmuring and and speaking against the very thing we're praying for, we're not happy people. How many people are truly excited and happy when they're complaining? Faces be betray that. Any face of somebody complaining is not smiling while they're complaining. They're scowling and they're angry. Uh, we're not happy. So we're not walking in victory at the very time that we're doing this. And God, that's not God's intention. You know, he said in this life we'll have trials and tribulation, but he didn't say we are going to be miserable from the moment we're born to the moment we're, we'll die. He said, I came that they may have life and have it more abundant. But we have got to learn to change our mindset. We've got to learn to change how we, how we view things. And then we've got to learn to, to respond according to the word. And that's been tough. And the fourth way we're going to look at in the way we get in God's way is disobedience. One of the best examples we can see how getting in God's way interferes with what he wants for us is in the area of finances. And oftentimes we learn this early in life. Um, there's a lot of mess ups in it. You know, I'm going to be real transparent here. It took me a long time to understand how to be a good steward over my money. And, it, and the reason was I don't care about money. I still don't care about money. So if I had money, I either spent it or gave it away. And, you know, I didn't think about next week. I just I was never a person of prayer. And then along comes credit cards. And, you know, I'm in my 20s with a credit card. I think I have free money. I'm going to buy what I want. You know, in 1991, or 1990 rather, uh, it was going to be my dad's 70th birthday. He's living in Atlanta. My whole family's on the East Coast. I'm out here. But I have a credit card. So I'm going to have a family reunion. And I invite my whole family. I don't just invite them out. I put them up in a hotel. We're having steak. I mean, I did this. I honestly did this. Um, you know, I, I even uh, ordered a porta potty because I only had one bathroom. So I have a big family. So I had one in the backyard. Um, you know, with a credit card. So, oh, you need that? Okay, go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. You know, and at the time, what was I? I'm going 50. I was, I was old enough to know better. In my 30s, I'm doing this. 
And I ended up spending five, six thousand dollars. You know, all plane tickets, places to stay. Everybody had a wonderful time. And, and honestly, I don't regret it. I really can't say I regret it right now because it was my dad's 70th birthday. But two months before everybody came, we found out he was diagnosed with terminal cancer. So it was our last time together. So in the big picture, you know, as, as I look back, I'm, I'm grateful for that time. But it was after that time that I realized I can't live like this. <laughs> and I made the decision it, uh, probably si within six months of the bills coming in, I made the decision that no more. I will not use this credit card for anything. I will get it paid off. And I did that. I did not use the credit card. It took me three, four years. I got it paid off. And to this day, again, I am a slow learner, but I do learn. And when I learn, I don't do the same thing. And once that credit card got paid off, to this day, I put on my credit card that I can pay at the end of the month. That's it. There's no, there's no looking at, well, I want or I need. Because you know what? A want can very easily become a need in your mind when you want something real bad. And it's really not a need. So once I, once I made that decision, my life got a lot easier in the, in the area of finances. But some people, it takes a lifetime to learn that. You know, other people learned it as a teenager in early 20s, and God bless you if you learn that, because that's a good lesson to know early in life without going through that. Proverbs 10.22 says, The blessings of the Lord makes a person rich, and he adds no sorrow to it. So, if our so-called blessings, as sometimes we like to say, look what the Lord blessed me with, but if it ends up bringing us financial ruin or debt or stress or unwanted phone calls, it's probably not a blessing of God. We sometimes tend to call things blessings of God when we get something new. But if, if the result of that is all those things, then it probably wasn't actually a blessing of God. It was more like an impulsive buy on our part. And we were calling it that when it's not. But when we follow God's plan for financial freedom, we learn to put off immediate gratification. And instead, we learn to work towards what we need. We, uh, we acquire the money, we save the money, and when we have the necessary funds, then we make the purchase. Proverbs 21.5 tells us, good planning and hard work, hard work leads to prosperity, but hasty shortcuts leads to poverty. Credit cards make for a hasty shortcut. So no matter how much money we bring in, we can still live in poverty. And the old saying goes, I, I think, you see people that the more they make, the more they spend, and sometimes you wonder, well, how, how can they not afford, or how are they having problems? They make a whole lot of money. But if your mindset hasn't been renewed, you're just going to, to spend more with what you bring in. If you haven't learned how to principally take care of your money and save and put away and, 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 and take the time to, to truly make a budget and stick with it. If we don't restrain our spending, so that we have enough money to do what we need to do, that's poverty. If you look at the stories of the lottery winners over the years, the, the statistics tell us that 70% of these millions and, and sometimes multi-million dollar winners, 70% within five or seven years go bankrupt. So money doesn't take away your problems. Money doesn't change things. If you don't know how to money manage a small amount of man money, you are not going to be able to manage a whole lot of money. It, it, it is up here. You have got to learn to manage what you have. And in managing what you have, then, you know, the more that you have, the more that you accumulate, you're going to still manage it just on a larger scale. If you're not managing what you have now, then what you get more of, you will not manage any better. And some red flags to let you know if, if money's an area is, is if you're paying for necessities with credit cards, then money might be a problem for you because it really we shouldn't be paying. Now, I'm not talking about a person that loses their job and there's a season of hardship where you have to use it. I'm talking about as a way of life. If you end up monthly paying for the things you absolutely need to live with a credit card, then budgeting might be a little problem for you. If you're transferring balances from a high credit limit to a lower one, you're just shuffling the money around, that might be a problem for you. If you think because you have a high credit limit, that's what I thought, you can afford it, you might have a problem. <laughs> I, they gave me a lot to play with, and I played with it. <laughs> if you get an uneasy feeling when you're doing your monthly bills, <laughs> you might have a problem. And if you get nervous every time the phone rings, wondering if it's that debt collector, you might have a problem. <laughs> What does the Bible say about debt? It says that debt is slavery and obligation. 
Proverbs 22, 7 says, Just as the rich rule the poor, so the borrower is servant to the lender. The term servant is really slave. Debt is bondage. Now, the Bible doesn't tell us it's always wrong to borrow. I'm not saying that at all. It just tells us that debt is bondage. There are times where it's necessary to borrow. But when you make a lifetime habit of this is how you live, constantly borrowing and always behind the eight ball because you're always having to spend tomorrow's money to pay back yesterday's debt, so therefore you can't ever get ahead, that's a problem. So how do we fix it? Well, we need to begin making spiritual decisions to realign our finances with God's plan. That's what the beginning is. If we have a problem in that area and we see that we've been praying, Lord, bless me, bless me, bless me, Lord, I need money, bless me. But we're not changing the way we handle money. Then we need to begin asking God to show us how to align our thinking with his thinking. We need to make significant changes in our mindset and our financial management. We need to make decisions to put God back in the driver's seat where he's belonged all along. And we have to decide to quit running ahead of God. And that's, that's the bottom line, that impulsiveness. We just run ahead of him. If, if we want him to bless us and we show ourselves faithful as stewards, he will bless us. Give him time. Give him time. We need to get rid of the mindset that we deserve certain things. You know, spring break used to come around when I worked at the school system. And I thought that meant time to buy. <laughs> I'm just being honest. It was like, okay, what I, what big thing can I buy because it's spring break? What, what sense does that make? You know, I looked for something to spend money on. It's like, oh, it's spring break. I, I was very immature when it came to finances, and I had to learn the hard way. So we need to wait on him. Praying to be debt-free without a change in our thought pattern in regards to spending will only find us back in the same place again. We need to allow God to renew our thinking when it comes to money. Now, disobedience can show up in other areas of our lives as well. In relationships, when, when we uh, operate in unforgiveness, we hinder God in doing the things we're praying for when we're operating in unforgiveness against someone. When we're gossiping, we hinder God from working in our lives. When we're lying, obviously, or when we're dishonest or constantly criticizing somebody, uncontrolled anger issues, all of those are areas where we need to ask God to help us if we're having problems with any of those. If we w truly want to walk in God's ways and want God to, to bless and, and answer our prayers, we need to be sure that we're not hindering him by these things that we do. Sin will hinder the answer to prayer. And, and we don't necessarily sin on purpose. We don't even know sometimes we're sinning. And the only way to truly know is if we do as pastor's been reminding us week after week, renew our minds, get in the word, know what the word says. Because I guarantee you, if you know what the word says, you will quickly know when you're sinning. Because it, the Holy Spirit will convict you. But it's easy to remain in sin if you're ignorant to what the word says about sin. The second greatest commandment God gives us is to love our neighbor as ourselves. And that's pretty difficult to do if we isolate or if we keep ourselves away from other people. You know, if that's the second greatest commandment of God, the first is loving him with everything we have. And the second is to love one another. Love your neighbor. doesn't necessarily mean the person that lives next door to you. But to love others as you love yourself. And some people, I it's a difficulty. It's a real difficulty to, to want to be around people. I know so many people that would prefer the company of animals to the company of people. But God, Jesus didn't come. He didn't die for animals. He came and died for your neighbor, for you and your neighbor. And so if, if we have difficulty in that area, that's another one. We need to ask God, help, help us to come out of that. And not only isolation, there's also people who spend time around other people that those people want to run from because it's not a type of person you want to be in their company. And if, you, if you're the type that approaches somebody and says, hi, how are you doing today, and proceeds to, to read off a litany of what's wrong with you because you didn't really care when you asked that person how they were, they probably aren't going to seek you out again. <laughs> They're certainly not going to ask you how you are. <laughs> but we have to be aware. What does it mean, loving, loving our neighbor? You know, it, it's actively loving them with the love of Christ. And if that's an area where we need help, we need to be asking for that. So how do we get out of God's way? It starts with recognizing we've been getting in God's way. That's the beginning, because if we don't recognize that's, you know, that's exactly what we've been doing, then we're probably not going to be looking for ways to change it. So we need to recognize either by the things we're saying or by the things we're doing, we're getting in God's way. 
And then it calls for repentance. We have to recognize this is not of God. God is not pleased with us staying in his word. So we need to repent. We need to pray and ask God to help us make the necessary changes in order for our words and our actions to line up with his word and his promise before us that the Lord's going to help us. And we need to grow in walking more by faith than by sight. And that's a lifelong process. It doesn't happen overnight. But don't go you in that area. It's amazing how God will do every single thing he says he will do when we're genuinely and truly seeking and open to changing our way and exchanging the way we want to do it for the way he wants to do it. The true key to getting out of God's way and seeing his word produce fruit in our lives and in the lives of those we're praying for and to see his word accomplish all that he sent it to do is found in, and if you'll turn with me, Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. We've heard this a number of times, but it is the key. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Sounds so simple, but it too takes a lot of time. But you know, we'll never learn to, to truly operate in this if we don't actively seek to operate in it and practice operating in it. It won't just come naturally to us. Proverbs 5, or rather Proverbs 3, verse 5. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Do not depend on your own understanding. And how often do we forget that? We may say we trust him, but we immediately look to our understanding to solve the problems before us. And, s- and verse 6, seek his will in all you do. I'm pretty sure if I had prayed and asked God what I should do when I wanted to have that family reunion, he wouldn't have told me, use a credit card. <laughs> I'm pretty sure. But I didn't seek him. I did what I wanted to do. Seek his will in all you do, and he will show you which path to take. Pretty plain language there, right? The harder part is actually doing it. But we're called to. So if you have a problem in any area of not seeing God answer us in prayer, and I'm not saying that these are the reasons always why, why God doesn't answer our needs. Sometimes, like I said earlier, he's a sovereign God who does what he's going to do in his timeline. We're to trust him that he's going to do it. But there are sometimes reasons that things don't happen for us to see and and for us to try to rationalize or understand it will just drive us crazy because God does what God wants to do. And being sovereign, who are we to ask him why it's not happening the way we want it to happen? Amen? Amen. All right. get out of God's way. Amen. Amen. All right. Praise the Lord. That was a good word this morning, wasn't it? And right on time. Hallelujah. This is the time of our service where we can give back to God in, um, in our tithes and offerings.